Long takes are a very special and unique technique employed in films. They bring the spectator closer to the piece and the creator by displaying a formulation of reality within the realistic confines of human perception in an attempt to reproduce our experience of the world in the most faithful way achievable by a two-dimensional depiction. Arguably, viewers experience their own lives as if in a long take in a film, in other words, without interruptions or cuts, disregarding the pauses on our conscious stream induced by sleep or fainting. The sense of continuity time-wise and individual apprehension of space seduced the individual on a subconscious level tenaciously, crafting an alternate representation for our senses with substantial fidelity. By employing a long take, it's possible to evoke emotions that ring closer to truth, or at least seem more veritable once seized and faced upon. When words and actions are chained in a continuous time frame and space, the outcome is a distinct sense of facticity that excels what a classic film montage could ever offer, though montage itself serves a distinct and relevant purpose as well for other kinds of filmmaking that shall be explored on a different video. This is why most directors eventually embrace it in some form or another, many of them only sporadically and for specific moments or scenes, while others relish permanently on its utterly mesmerizing raw magnetism. It's not unusual nowadays, for example, to come across with films whose very first scene is a long take, oftentimes using Steadicam, in an intentional attempt to draw in the audience, only to subtly return to the more conventional montage scheme shortly afterwards. One will easily recognize the use of long takes as well on a particularly central piece of a film of notorious physical dynamic and action, or of essential dramatic importance, so as to confer an additional effectiveness or to simply emphasize its intended effect. More rarely, but getting increasingly popular, you'll also find films who are entirely shot on one take, such as The Russian Ark or Victoria, or at least attempt to reproduce it by welding separately shot scenes with the aid of digital effects and techniques such as Birdman or 1917. Regardless of how extensive its use has been, its effect is undeniable and gazed at with reverence. What's the difference then between a long take and a sequence shot? Whereas a typical long take is usually part of a scene or narrative sequence, the sequence shot instead is itself a full scene, without cuts, shot with a single camera and therefore begetting its own birth and demise. Not unlike a self-manifesting cinematic demiurge of sorts. In it, montage becomes obsolete, or in other words, editing happens inside the camera, which on one hand means one doesn't have to worry with producing shot reverse shots, to care about match cuts and other continuity errors, or with following the 180 rule, but on the other hand, this technique requires instead a supplementary and incredibly rigorous planning, many times demanding intricate blocking, much lengthier and thorough rehearsals, and pure eventiveness, so as to be able to guide the crew and avoid the traps that naturally arise, when one is not able to easily hide all the things that make a film possible, and that are usually safely protected behind the lens of the camera. It's hard work, no doubt about it, but the result can turn a simple film into an art piece. A few towering directors from the golden age of cinema, known for their iconic long takes and sequence shots are Wells, Murnau, Mizoguchi, Tarkovsky, Antonioni, Ophüls, Kalatozov, Jancho, Bergman, Ozu, with several of them having been referred to already previously on this channel. On a more contemporary level, directors such as Bilator, Nuri Bilicelan, the Darden brothers, Lav Diaz, Mikhail Aneki, Alexander Sokurov, Ho Shaoxian, Bruno Dumont, Ruben Eastland, and the inevitable Hollywood based Martin Scorsese, Brian De Palma, Paul Thomas Anderson, Alfonso Cuaron, and Alejandro Iñárritu have made also extensive use of this cinematic device with stunning results. Theodoros Angelopoulos, the Greek film master acclaimed for cinematic masterworks that featured way above average shot length and indelible sequence shots, brimming with poetic sensibility and profound humanistic probing, is also another of the many directors to have successfully used this precise technique comprehensively throughout his career, in fact turning it somewhat into a stylistic trademark of his. The scene analysis that follows is taken from his great 1991 work The Suspended Step of the Stork, the first film in what has later become known as the Trilogy of Borders. This is a fairly uncomplicated and short sequence shot, lasting only two minutes, but it's a perfect example of how a great director can release himself from the granitic, segmented nature of colloquial montage and explore different shots and framing, and organically bind them through a single, uninterrupted take 
that adequately depicts the design mood and invites the viewer to invest himself in the scene by conferring a definitive sense of factual observation, blurring the lines of the canvas that stands between the conscious subject and the inspected object. The scene starts with a close-up of a TV screen, with a video paused on a frame that shows an individual that plays a vital role in the narrative, as he is suspected by the main character, a young TV reporter, to be a missing Greek politician that had suddenly disappeared some years before. The footage was captured while he was covering a story on the refugees converging on the Greek border, and the resemblance of the person strikes him as uncanny. As the camera slowly recedes and zooms out, the viewer is shown to be on what appears to be a television control room that exhibits the preparations for a TV show that is about to begin, the host and guests captured by the studio cameras on the other screens. When the camera pans down and shifts the focus to the foreground, it is revealed a book written by the missing politician, being held by the main character. The initial close-up, therefore, turns into an over-the-shoulder shot and consequently develops into a medium shot with the reporter's back turned to the audience. At this point, the camera delicately halts and the scene breathes, as the reporter looks at both the TV screen and the book, reading then the beginning of the book's prologue for a short time before dropping it and ruminating for a while. At some point, the program's rehearsal and the soundcheck voiced on the speakers interrupt his meditation, which leads him to stand up and depart from the table. During this movement, the camera follows him and when panning left, it reveals the open nature of the glass-encased room, dollying in as he approaches the balcony from which he can oversee the TV studio beneath, where the talk show is about to start, once again with his back facing the camera, and by now turned into a broader medium shot. He seems somewhat uneasy and anxious, which is soon explained as a passing co-worker questions him in regards to his presence there, to which the reporter replies that he's looking for the boss. As he moves in towards his colleague, the boss comes in and he requests for the permission of holding his camera crew a couple of days more with him, so as to investigate the suspected missing politician he believes to have found. As of then, the shot is framing the characters a tiny bit wider, having coalesced into a final American shot, also known as a three-quarters shot or cowboy shot. The scene then ends with the reporter attempting to further reinforce his request as his superior moves out of the frame. During this whole scene, it is then possible to witness a variety of techniques that are subtly applied so as to produce a cohesive and lively structure in visual terms, with focus pulling, dollying, panning and zooming, that unite seamlessly to produce a single take that at the hands of more traditional filmmakers would result in an assembly of the various close-ups, over-the-shoulder shots, medium and American shots through montage, as is seen in ordinary films. Out of curiosity, it'll be interesting to notice how the scale of the framing is successively augmented for each consecutive shot within the sequence, the sequence shot then acting almost as a reverse establishing shot that opts to disclose the spatial features of the scene sequentially, bit by bit, instead of presenting it as complete already from the start. It will be fruitful to acquaint oneself with Angelopoulos' own words, for he is quoted as saying that the sequence shot offers, as far as I'm concerned, much more freedom but it is true that the spectator needs to be more involved in it. Through it, it is possible to preserve both unity of space and unity of time. The film does not acquire an artificial pace at the editing table. In a certain manner, for me, each shot is a living thing with a breath of its own that consists in inhaling and exhaling. This is a process that cannot accept any interference. It must have a natural opening and fading. In these seamless constructs lies the beauty and magic of the sequence shot, both in the faithful recreation of the elapsing of time and in the visual continuity of its elements to shape a fiction with the most realistic and enveloping aspect of experience for a spectator that is constricted by the two-dimensionality of the film canvas. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to like, comment or subscribe to the channel, as more videos pertaining to film directors and classic films, their history and inspiration are uploaded every month. Thank you for watching and see you next time.